thank you for the introduction and, and for having me here today. Uh, the topic of my talk today is uh, we're going to talk about 65 years of spatial data uh, or the scheme experimental data, or excuse me, yeah, database. Uh, first thing I want to do is welcome you to the scheme experimental forest through pictures. We're going to have a lot of pictures, a lot of maps going through this, a lot of historic pictures actually. Uh, we're going to start off and go over a little bit of a history of the EEF, uh, talk about how the data has been collected and converted over time. Uh, talk about the GIS database and uh, the layers and usage and take a little bit farther with some of the hyperlinks and file conversions we're looking at doing to again sort of reach a broader audience and talk about some future opportunities that can come from this. So again starting with the history of the, of the EEF, you'll hear me talk say the EEF quite a bit again for this game experimental forest. Uh, these are the locations of USDA Forest Service experimental areas across the US uh, you can see a circle down, and I'll zoom in in a second so you can see a better idea of where it is in Alabama. Uh, the Southern Research Station actually maintains 19 of these experimental forests, and the EEF is one or two that are privately owned. Uh, it was established in 1947. Uh, it's located near Bruton, Alabama. Uh, the actual owner is T.R. Miller Mill Company. And the USDA Forest Service actually manages the property and they, they're managing it on a 99 year lease at no cost. And if you, any of you are uh, familiar with Only Pine and publications, that's, that's Dr. Bill Boyer. He was stationed on the EF for quite a number of years. Uh, this is a picture of the range of Only Pine, and there's a, there's a again, pretty good sized dot for where the EEF is located within the range. Uh, in 47, uh, the the Scambi experimental forest was in the heart of what was then second growth only pine. There was only about 6.2 million acres uh, left of only at the time. Again, what you saw in that map a minute ago was at roughly that 90 million acres. Uh, again, just for context, we're down to about half of that now. Uh, the Forest Service actually hired Dr. Dr. Croker to go across the southeast and look for areas to establish uh, an experimental forest like this. He met T.R. Miller in Bruton and got looking at sites and found that what, what was then to be the EEF. Again, it's, it's a 3,000 acre track. And one of the main things, the whole reason this came about was uh, Lonely Pine was that were, we were having trouble being able to successfully regenerate stands and manage stands. That's one of the reasons we continue to lose them. And so that was one of the big functions of setting up the EEF to try to solve some of these problems. Uh, some of the problems at the time, this was a, a common picture. This is out of Wallenberg. Again, anybody familiar with, with uh, publications for Lonely Leaf, that was a book. Uh, published in 46. Uh, so the topics that they were interested in trying to uh, answer were natural regeneration, trying to come up with management alternatives, uh, figure out more information about growth in the over long leaf, uh, what types of rotational links, thinning densities, uh, looking at forest grazing, and even economic uh, costs and returns. Uh, some of the things that have, have been brought about because of work done on the EEF, we found out of it's a successful way to regenerate one leaf using the shelter wood method. Uh, quite a bit of work's been done with stand management alternatives, looking at even age, two aged, and uneven age management. And a, a lot of information about fire ecology, looking at season of burn, frequency, and being able to work with mid and understory composition. This is, a, again, just a quick boundary of the EEF, again, 3,000 acres. If you look, the southern boundary of the forest is actually the Florida state line. So let's, 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 this presentation is on GPS and GIS. So I just want to give you a little bit of, of background to tell you, because again, all this feeds into what data has existed over the 65 years. Uh, over 60 years, uh, since the beginning, they have been collecting uh, data, uh, again, mostly manually with, with maps, colored pencils, and bins, and uh, information about seed crops, uh, harvest, uh, prescribed fire management, again, yearly, with, with what date and success. Uh, timber stand improvement, a uh, whole wide range of various research projects, field demonstrations, and, and even photographs. Uh, this is an example, again, what is it still up to today is used as the day-to-day -day management on this game experimental forest. Uh, again, just a uh, plat map this part of the atlas, it's their plat map, it's got uh, the, the EEF broken down into 40 acre compartments, and the managers go through every year, they highlight the areas they're gonna burn, call it with a colored pencil and go on. And so one of the things we want to do is convert this into a digital form and convert all these 65 years of data into a form that can be easily used and, and, and tracked and continue to add to in the future. 
So, uh, one of the things to, to convert this into digital form, uh, the whole database is being built in Esri ArcGIS 10. Uh, again, we're taking these hand drawn maps, we're scanning them, geo referencing them, and then digitizing out all these individual burns, all these individual harvests, all, all these individual management activities that are going on on the ground. Uh, adding the attribute data again from the atlas, what's been written in as you go, detailed reports and records, trying to put all that into a database that can be, again, be queried and be able to be worked with. Uh, also doing quite a bit of GPS data collection, again, take the parts of the atlas that you see and connect it to the ground with the submeter accuracy as best as we can. And then building the metadata that goes behind this uh, in the history, you know, who collected what, how, how was it collected, and again, to help us give her a better record, to give us context for our data as we go forward. Uh, again, we talked about submeter data collection, looking at property corners, compartment corners, uh, buildings, roads, going to look at individual fire breaks, streams, uh, a, wide, uh, a wide selection of research plots, uh, and then even looking at some of, the, some of the studies are actually down to the individual trees. So you'll actually get to see some individual tree, basically have a whole 40 acre compartment stem mapped, actually two. Uh, so this is sort of, if you move towards the updated version, taking the same map before with the fire information taken off, this is the blank digital version of the compartment map and sort of what we've put together with all the streams and roads and the whole system for the EEF. And again, this is sort of what we're using as our, as our background for everything as we build forward. So again, all the individual layers, we've gone in and we've digitized uh, for the seed crop locations, uh, for harvest, uh, whether it was a thinning, a regeneration cut, or crop tree removal. Prescribed fire, uh, as you can see, uh, we're looking at, these are the, let's see, that's harvest. So for prescribed fire, the one I showed a minute ago, you can see that we've got year and the date for each fire. For timber stain improvement, we've got uh, locations of hardwood injections or invasive species. Again, keeping that, and again, that's growing with time, unfortunately, but to, using this system, we're able to now keep up with where they are and do better management. Uh, again, we're, the system also gives us the ability to track research plots. Again, we go back into the history to see what was done in a certain area and keep up with that as we go forward in the future, which gives a, a lot of opportunities to overlay new research projects to answer more questions, again, having that background information and not having to go back to the plat and look at the individual atlas pages. And the other thing we'll talk about a little bit is the Farm 40. Uh, one of the things about the Scandia that's been a, a huge success for it is field demonstrations, taking landowners out and land managers and showing them the effects of uh, being able to do natural regeneration, prescribed fire, uh, and, and again, to see how long they can be managed and the productivity of these types of management applications. So on the Farm 40, uh, it, is anybody familiar with the Farm 40? A few people uh, in the history, uh, the Farm 40 again was established with the stand in 47. Uh, they, over the years they've done uh, excuse me, field demonstrations where they, and at one point it was yearly, they would bring landowners out, they would cut whatever the growth of the year for the forest was and lay all the products out and bring landowners out to see. Uh, at the times they showed turpentine, pulp wood, poles, the whole nine yards. And I've got some pictures to show it later on. So uh, quite a bit of, of intense measurements have been done on the Farm 40. We have a huge uh, record of that. In 77, this was the stand map. And this is what, again, until we started working on this, what they pretty much used. So zooming in, uh, again, going everything in age classes from seedlings all the way up to what they call the old growth and including uh, the branch and the flat areas from the slash. And again, this is what, what most of the management records have looked like. So what we did is going in and taking a digitized, and this is just an example to show, again, one of the, one of the products. Uh, we went in and we digitized all the harvest since uh, 77 to update that map. And again, there were five harvests stem from below. Uh, they removed uh, the thin pines and removed hardwoods, did a regeneration cut, uh, crop tree removal, and then Hurricane Ivan did uh, pretty much a good bit of damage across, which is just one big polygon. So as you can see, each one's color coded for the different operations. So you take the updated age classes and you take all the GPS data that we've added in. Again, this, this takes that map to the future and creates sort of a digital record that we can then use to go forward. And so this is what we're hoping with as much data as we can going across to show for the whole forest. So GIS database layers and usage. Uh, we've continued to add different layers. Uh, again, historic aerial photos. I've got photos going back to the 50s and I think early 40s. Uh, added topographic layers. Uh, soils, slope, aspect, 
land cover, uh, geological information, and watershed boundaries. Again, this whole plethora of background maps that go in to sort of help support this database and give us more options to be able to do different analysis. Uh, the historic photo archive is pretty cool. Uh, we were able to pull data from the USDA Forest Service, from the Farm Service Agency, and the Alabama uh, Historic Photo Archive, which uh, gives a really good blanket of, of historic photos. Uh, again, that's great to be able to go back and again, you can look and see how that management looked on the ground comparing the photos to what we have as records of management when the harvest were done. It's really easy to pop out when we did the 40 acre uh, seed tree cuts and things like that to be able to see that pop out. So it's a great thing to put in. Uh, the soil slope and aspect layers. Uh, believe it or not, when I was working on my master's, the soils data had not been released digitally. So we had sit down, we, we scanned the soil survey, took my, put my all over the top, and I actually traced, well, we split it up, uh, another friend and I did the whole 3,000 acres. And so we actually hand digitized it, scanned it, and converted it from there. Uh, about two years later, they released it. <laughs> uh, another thing we did is looking at uh, a 30 meter, uh, digital elevation model. I plucked out slope and aspect. Classified slope into three categories. As you can see, 8% slope is about as high as we've got. Not a lot of slope on this Gambia. It was a good exercise to see and it, it's been used later on. Also classified aspect. Again, we can overlay all these different research projects and see, again, what the lay of the terrain is and see if that's causing any, any problems as we go along. I should show an example of that. Uh, this is the, the soils data. So all the individual polygons that we digitized from the soil survey and classified by type. Uh, here's the slope data. Again, not a whole lot of slope. See some areas down around sort of wetter areas, but pretty much not much slope on the Escambia. And this is aspect, again, classified out in the different cardinal directions. Uh, as we talked about, just showing some examples of those base layers. This is the NLCD uh, data, just as a background, shows up very well, showing most of the pine that's on, on the Escambia. Really good, really good matchup for the classifications. Uh, so how do we use this? We've got all this data together and all working in the database. One of the things we try to do is take a look. Uh, Hurricane Ivan uh, impacted the forest in 2004, caused quite a bit of disturbance. And one of the things we were interested in doing is seeing if, if we could pick up any, you know, was it a certain soil type of handle, a certain slope, things like that. Uh, the ROGS, which I'll show some examples later on, is actually the regional only pine growth study. It's a growth study that was installed in the early 60s. And so we have a couple hundred fifth acre plots across the forest. We have all the trees actually stem mapped. And so we're able to go down, if a tree was tipped over or you know leaning, we were able to go back and take a look at individual tree records and know which soil, which slope, which aspect those individual trees were located on to see if we could find out some information from of what was going on with the hurricane. And pretty much the results showed us the slope and aspect were not a factor on the EF as you might have, might have figured. Uh, 11 of the 13 plots were, uh, that were destroyed were actually open on their east side. And from what we understand it's the way the spinning of the hurricane, that, that, that makes pretty good sense. Uh, nine of the 13 plots were actually uh, adjacent to a wood road. And troop souls seem to uh, they be, have the least loss because our, our hypothesis is they have the deepest eight horizon. So it seems to be that fault. But all in all, it was pretty much a chaotic event. Uh, again, if they were open on the east side or they had been recently thin, they took the most damage. Again, this database gave us the ability to be able to look at that. So, uh, as we talk about sort of the data that's in there, we, we've continued to add more, we've been sort of even looking at some different file conversions. Uh, one of the things that uh, the Forest Service had is a pretty in-depth historic photo archive, actual photographs on the ground, and it's not just, uh, you know, they have information that describes where it is, who took it, and so we can actually almost use that as part of a, uh, photo points going across time. And so we're able to uh, hyperlink these photos in, combine them with photo points that actually do exist on the forest. Uh, we scan these images and then hyperlink them into ArcGIS. So as you pull the little symbol up, you can click on it and see maybe what that area looked like in 1947. We actually have the original walkthrough, what it looked like in 64, what it looked like in 78 up to now. So it's a great way to look and see how the management of the forest and see how the thing, how it's actually changed over time or it's not. Uh, you look, again, file conversions help get into that process. So as you look for, over on the right, this is sort of just a mosaic of pictures that are in the database. The original uh, 1947 walk, uh, we've got images of harvest, uh, different management activities, research, and, and again, the demonstrations. Again, actual Forest Service personnel working with the landowners. 
And again, with putting this together, it's, it's a legacy of data that can help us go forward and again, continue to educate the public. Uh, this is an example of the photo points and the, the photo, or excuse me, the, the photo archive. Uh, this is what they actually look like in, in their actual tangible archive. We scanned these individual photos, uh, entered all the information we could get from it, who took the picture, where it was taken, and then tried to link that back to a place on the ground on the forest. And so again, this is an area I can take you back today to the exact spot and show you where it was, what it looks like now and what it looked like in 1955 when it was being burned. Uh, again, we have the photo points, and the photo points we have, uh, those are actually designed for this purpose. They're actually posted in the ground where pictures have been taken periodically throughout the, uh, the history of the EEF, and so again, we're able to do the same thing there. Uh, again, you're able to pick up in these areas a, a variety of research uh, and demonstration areas. And what we'd like to do is take this forward and show, build virtual tours, so you can take a look at actual areas. And again, before and after shots. So this is the Farm 40, that 40 acre uh, area I was telling you about. Again, the history of this was to show a private landowner if you only had 40 acres, this is, they kept up with the management records. So they could explain to a landowner, if you've only got 40 acres and you wanna manage long leaf, if you do it in these types of management, you can, this is what you get. And so again, this is the area that they would lay the products out every year. Again, the pictures are coming. So sorry I was an understock stand. They went in and uh, continuously burned, take out, uh, you know, timber stand improvement cuts along the way, continue to build the stand up to what is now is pretty much an uneven age stand. It's beautiful. And they're able to get periodic harvest along the way. So this is it in 1952, and then again in 1998, and this is what it looks like now. So again, just a great way to be able to tell a story visually, spatially, whole nine yards. Uh, talked a little bit, or haven't really talked much about file conversions. One of the things we want to do is, is to be able to get the data out, and this is going to come up a little bit. How many of you are GIS users? Quite a bit. All right. So, one of the, how many of you do not use ArcGIS but use Google Earth and some of the other programs out there? We got a few. All right. So, one of the things we'd like to do is we move forward to this. One thing we want to do is be able to get these products out, this database out for ArcGIS users. But not about, not everybody's out there, and a lot of private landowners are not. So, one of the things we want to do is convert the in, individual layers to KML, KMZ, so we can put them out on the web and let landowners be able to get to it. Again, you can do add pictures. Uh, we can talk, uh, again, for non-GIS use and forest service. We can talk about uh, management and research activities. And again, it creates a, a great virtual learning center that we can really promote long leaf and management of this type. So again, sort of our effort of how to reach our audience. Uh, I think it'd be a great way to put this information together to create some online educational tools. We'll talk more about long leaf pine management, growth and yield, fire ecology and you know and even spatial resources because the idea of how all this is moving forward I, I know the gentleman before me was talking you know if you look into your in your organization and you don't have spatial data well maybe you've got paper maps that are floating around that those are spatial data if we can find a way to tap, tie those into places on the ground you can start to build your own database and again not not lose these files uh, I think it's a great way to move forward with these virtual demonstrations and tours. I can actually take you, if you pull up the map, you can click along, along the areas and see pictures of what it looked like in the past, what it looks like now, and actually tour the forest. Uh, the Forest Service has given quite a few tours over the years when there's actually a script in individual places across the forest and we're gonna make that virtual. Uh, as we talked about the demonstrations areas, these are the Farm 40 field days, which at times were done on a yearly basis. Again, uh, they would go in and measure the growth of the forest. They would cut the growth, lay it out as products, and let landowners come in and see what can be grown in a year. I assume this actual example may have been in a little bit longer interval, possibly five years. And so, again, a great way to tie information on the ground back to what they're doing management-wise. Uh, we can also link in the publications. So you can take a look at, at the science behind it and tag all that in, into our GIS system. Uh, I talked a little bit about the regional only pine growth study. Uh, again, as part of learning and education, ROGS provides a, a great foundation for this. Uh, we're able to look at, build virtual tours and educational opportunities about managing at different densities, uh, looking at different products and non-timber products. Uh, if you look at the bottom, this is an example stem map of fifth acre plot, and this plot's initial start it was thinned back to 300, or excuse me, 600 trees per acre, and throughout its its time in the study, it's been maintained at 60 square feet. 
Siding decks is 70 feet, base age 50. Utility pole production began at age 35. Uh, pine straw production at age 20 was around 168 bales per acre per year, and regeneration was already present on the stand. You see a picture, oh, I'm really making an echo here. <laughs> Uh, and again, you can see a picture over the side. So we're able to tie all that information together. So if you want to look at a stand that's being managed at 30, 60, 90, 120, or 150 square feet, we can show you the data and a visual representation all in one database. For fire ecology, uh, again, fire ecology has been a very important uh, part of the Scambia and management of longleaf. Uh, you're able to go in with this system. You can put, we've made or making all of the studies digital. And so you can look at season of earn, look at frequency, uh, and different uh, applications of chemical and mechanical treatments. And so we could pull up the actual map, you click on the area, you can take a look at the picture, and, and what we'd like to do is build it in where it's sort of a quiz. So when was this burned? So this, to go ahead and sort of give you a, a quick answer to it, this, this one is, it's no chemical treatment and growing season burn. But if I go across and I show you ones that have been burned in the winter, the summer, the spring, and we can actually show you ones that have had mechanical and chemical site prep. You can see the whole array without ever having to visit the Scambia and take a look and see is this what desired outcome would you like? And this might be your vehicle to get there. Uh, another thing we're doing is part of a master's project and a, a senior uh, capstone project. We stem map 240 acre uh, compartments. This is the actual Farm 40. Stem mapped and uh, pulled, pulled it into Esri's arc scene and did a, did a relationship with diameter, and you actually get a 3D version of the stand. One of the things we'd like to move forward with this is you can pull it up, you can spin it around, you can zoom in, look at gaps, look at uh, dense areas, you can actually create a virtual thinning simulator, and then take people out onto the ground and show them these areas that you might be able to do things. So, again, another people sometimes. There's a lot of options that can be done with this, a lot of cool things you can do for learning. So uh, I think there's a lot of future opportunities with the database in the Scambia uh, for monitoring. You can see how the forest is progressing over time. See, again, to be able to keep up and be able to plan management. Uh, again, to continue the history of demonstration, I think this is a great opportunity to take the Scambia experimental forest into the digital age and continue our outreach and, and virtual tours or create virtual tools. Uh, just to give you another quick example, uh, again with the ROGS, the growth study, they've gone in and actually put in time replication blocks every 10 years. So you, every 10 years you establish uh, an age class on the same site, in, similar site index soil, and continue measuring. As you look at the different measurements, we're actually seeing an increase in growth. And so if someone's interested in looking at that, we can actually tie all that back to the individual trees, individual plots on the ground. It's all part of the, the larger database as a whole. So we're really looking at that, maybe see what, what's actually causing that. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, you know, it's 65 years of spatial data that, that's really intertwined into one big database. It's a legacy of lonely fine research and management that hopefully we're going to be able to get it out so you can you can access it at your fingertips. Uh, maps and photographs are going to be available online. We haven't gotten there yet, but that's what we're looking forward to doing with a lot of opportunities between education, demonstration, and research. One of the things that generally follows something like this, you know, you don't try this at home, but uh, in this case, we want you to try it at home. You know, if this is something that appeals to you in your job or your, or your personal property, there's a lot of options out there for you to be able to put something together. Uh, how many of you work with private landowners? All right. Uh, if you're interested, if private landowners are interested in doing GIS, uh, don't use ArcGIS or haven't moved in that direction. We put together a booklet for them. Uh, we got funding from the LM Forest Forever uh, as a grant to, to create a tutorial for five online programs: uh, Google Earth, Web Soil Survey, uh, the Geospatial Data Gateway. The only thing that, that dates it or puts it to Alabama is the Historic Photo Archive from the University of Alabama, but they do have maps across the nation and Canvas, which is a program from the National Agroforestry Center that lets you do virtual visual simulations. So I have a couple copies back there, but it's free to download out on our, on our website, and I'll be glad to I'll leave it up so you can get to it now. But uh, again, that gives landowners the ability to work with Google Earth, Web Soil Survey, and the primary thing is for somebody to be able to sit down, if they know the location of the property they're interested in, to be able to create a stand map, an aerial photo, soils, and a topo map again, just for their property, because that's that's the basic of management, no matter what you're doing. 
Uh, I'd like to thank T.R. Miller Mill Company, USDA Forest Service, Bill Boyer and Robert Fair, uh, George Ward, Ron Tucker, and David Dyson, which are the managers of the EEF. And again, they're really anxious to see this move forward and, and convert to this digital form and see the fin finished product. I'd like to thank Auburn University School of Forestry and Wildlife Science, the senior capstone groups. That brings me to the end of my time. I thank you for yours and be glad to take any questions if we have time. We have time for a few questions. Sure. Yes, sir. I have a, I, 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 we actually in the department changed printers, so I was only able to get all five copies before I came, but you're welcome to. Uh, we've run out of all the color copies, but I have black and white, but this color is it's online as a PDF. And again, what it was built as is, is a tutorial to help a landowner sit down to be able to find their piece of property and again, make those three core maps. Yes, sir. How do you plan to serve this out? Uh, I guess one of the options that we've come up with, uh, the question was for those in the back, uh, how, would we want, how would we publish this out? Uh, we'd definitely like to have it on a, out on a website uh, through the Forest Service. Uh, one option potentially is uh, ArcGIS Online, is what we'd really like to do, and be able to, again, house these other conversions as KML, so anybody can pull it up and we get it on Google Earth. Yes, sir. What is the date that you have in mind to have this all available online? Uh, the project's due at the end of November of this year, so again, it, it'll go back to the Forest Service and then we'll see how, how long it takes to go from there to go out. Hopefully soon. Yes, sir. Other questions? Okay. Uh, actually, we have uh, about... Oh, thank you, John. Thank you.